Good morning. My name is Andrea Jenkins. I'm the president of the Minneapolis City Council, and I'm going to call to order this regular meeting for Thursday, May 25th. This morning, we have two resolutions to present, which we will do before taking up our regular order of business. And the first resolution will be presented by council members Wansley and Chavez. And it is a resolution honoring victims of police brutality. And um, Council Members Wansley and Chavez will present that resolution. And then, thank you, Council President. I would also like to invite Council Members uh, Jeremiah Ellison, Council Member Aisha Chuck Tai, to also, and Council Member uh, Payne, to join to read the resolution with me. Um, also, I would like to invite Toshira and Jerome. Uh, we have uh, representatives here who serve families who've been impacted by police brutality. So I would like to invite you to come up and stand alongside us. Thank you so much, Toshira, for joining us. Um, and also, I just want to highlight, you know, I want to say thank you to the families who also um, aren't here with us today. Um, as we honor the life of George Floyd um, and the third anniversary of his murder by Minneapolis police. And in light of that, knowing that we have such a extensive dark history around um, police brutality in our city and the list of impacted families is just far too long. Um, so I just want to reaffirm my commitment um, to our community, to our families who've been impacted by this. Um, and the fight for a comprehensive public safety system that does not create victims um, and survivors and making sure that you all receive the highest quality of public services that goes beyond policing. Um, I also want to highlight, you know, all of us take our position seriously as those who are standing here with our impacted families and make sure you continue to hold our feet to the fire about building an accountable public safety system um, because it is the lack of political will that got us to this moment, to the moment where George Floyd was lynched in front of the world. And so many other family members who did not receive justice in a traditional sense. So I just want to publicly make that declaration because uh, far too long in Minneapolis, we make symbolic gestures about what needs to happen around policing and there's no follow through on the action piece. So in light of that, um, I asked my fellow council members to read the resolution. Um, if you could take two sentences each, that would be great. Um, but the title of the resolution is Honoring Victims of Police Brutality and Their Families and Communities Three Years After the Murder of George Floyd by Minneapolis Police Officer Derek Chauvin. Whereas the murder of George Floyd brought international attention to the practices of the Minneapolis Police Department. But George Floyd was not the first person treated with violence or killed by the Minneapolis police. And whereas there are many victims of police brutality and unjust policing across the country, including victims of brutal policing by officers of the Minneapolis Police Department and... Whereas if we are to honor the, and acknowledge the hardship of victims of police brutality and create systemic change, we must uh, boldly and clearly name the problem. And whereas a 2020 Star Tribune article reported long before former officer Derek Chauvin knelt on George Floyd's neck, the, the third precinct in South Minneapolis had a reputation for being home to police officers who played by their own rules. And whereas dozens of residents have sued the city for alleged police misconduct, and whereas the city of Minneapolis has paid millions of dollars to settle lawsuits brought 
by individuals against Minneapolis police officers, and whereas the Minnesota Department of Human Rights found probable cause that the Minneapolis Police Department engages in a pattern or practice of discriminatory race-based policing, and Minneapolis police officers use higher rates of more severe force against black individuals compared to white individuals in similar circumstances. And whereas the MDHR found probable cause that the Minneapolis Police Department teaches a paramilitary culture and by teaching an approach to policing that emphasizes aggression, MPD creates a culture that results in unnecessary escalation and or excessive force during count encounters with community members of all racial backgrounds. And whereas the MDHR found that in a statistically representative sample of use of force files from January 1st, 2010 to December 31st, 2020, Minneapolis police officers used unnecessary and inappropriate levels of force in 28.6% of incidents in which they recorded using force and in 76.5% of incidents in which another po Minneapolis police officer inappropriately used force. Another officer should have but failed to intervene. And whereas the MDHR reported that Minneapolis police officers, quote, consistently use racist, misogynistic, and otherwise disrespectful language, and whereas this country has not yet sufficiently invested in restorative, reparative, and healing services for individuals who allege misconduct or excessive force by police or the families and communities of those impacted by police violence and whereas some of the physical, emotional, and psychological trauma that individuals may sustain from encounters with police may not be visually evident, but can have long-standing impacts nonetheless. And whereas some individuals do not survive encounters with police, and whereas the lives lost and the trauma and violence experienced by community members due to encounters with police are costly consequences of systemic racism in policing in this country. And whereas victims of police brutality are fathers, mothers, children, siblings, neighbors, and friends, students, workers, artists, athletes, and community, um, community leaders, and some of our fellow residents, and Whereas police brutality can forever change the lives of not only, only the victim, but also their family and community. And whereas police brutality and violence can, have neg can negatively impact uh, residents, families, and diverse communities across Minneapolis. And whereas all residents deserve to feel safe in Minneapolis, including safe from misconduct or excessive force by police officers and Whereas discussions of police brutality can be painful and uncomfortable, and whereas honesty reckoning with the realities of police brutality is a prerequisite for eliminating it. And whereas the city of Minneapolis and the Minneapolis Police Department have entered into a settlement agreement with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights and have agreed to implement sufficient processes to identify and intervene early to prevent police misconduct and brutality from occurring. And whereas residents play a vital role in holding the city accountable to following through on the Minneapolis, the city of Minneapolis's promises to fulfill the requirements of the settlement agreement with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, which are de designed to prevent race-based discriminatory policing and excessive uses of force. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby recognize the pain and trauma that can result from discriminatory policing and use of excessive force by police that the city of Minneapolis honors all victims of police brutality, their families, and their communities. Um, I just wanna give a moment for Toshira, um, if you would like to share words about, um, you know, the work that you've been doing in light of you losing your own loved one to police brutality and being put in the position to support those who have had to go through that same preventable tragedy. Um, and I just wanna say thank you so much for continuing to fight and support for those families, to continue to hold politicians like myself and those on this dais accountable to make sure that 
what you experience, what you live every day, your son, the families that you support to make sure that we make decisions that do not create those same conditions and moments of grief, of trauma. So I want to give the floor to you. I'm sorry. I want to thank all of you guys. Um, although the father of my son did not lose his life at the hands of the Minneapolis police, it was the St. Paul to have your loved one stolen from you and have the entire story turned around to have your family. We get our loved ones murdered twice. We don't just, they don't just take our loved ones from us. After our loved ones are stolen, then we have to fight the truth of what really happened to our loved one. And I'm very grateful because this showed acknowledgement today. With George Floyd, the city of Minneapolis, the state of Minnesota, and the world had no choice but to acknowledge that murder of that black man. But with so many more of us, Communities United Against Police Brutality has documented where there's been almost 500 bodies at the hands of law enforcement here in the state of Minnesota since the year 2000. I currently work with families that come from 1996, 1997, so it's not even counting those families. The reason, the reason that I founded Family Support and Families Against Police Violence as a support group was to give direct support to families that do not have support when their loved ones are stolen at the hands of law enforcement, where it, if your loved one is stolen by a regular civilian here in Minnesota, there's support. But if your loved one is killed by law enforcement, your loved one is not assumed to be a victim. And as we've seen with George Floyd, Philando Castile, and many others, that they clearly were victims. There's many George Floyds around the state of Minnesota. I'm very grateful that you guys are taking this time to acknowledge because that is what the families have been asking for and pleading for, the acknowledgement of the hurt and the harm that has been inflicted. If there's almost 500 bodies at the hands of law enforcement, there is coworkers, children, wives, mothers that are impacted and hurting by this. What we see with George Floyd, it's not the result. The uprise that we seen was not the result of only one life. It was many more lives that came before him and after him that have been failed to be acknowledged. And it's time. But not only the acknowledgement, now it's time to work together to figure out how will we build a relationship with the impacted community? How will they have a seat at the table? How will they help direct the change that is needed because there is a clear change? We are in a state of emergency here in the United States, but specifically here in the epicenter of where the uprising happened, which is the state of Minnesota. We need to move and swiftly because the pot is still brewing. People are still being killed at the hands of law enforcement. So the last thing I want to say, because I don't want to take up too much time, is that I started this support group, but it turned into a nonprofit organization to help people with funeral costs, to help people with therapy costs, to help people with um, a place to come, a safe place to come where they could tell their reality and their truth without having the backlash. 
and we work really hard. But the main point was to be the support that I didn't have when Justin was stolen away from me and my son. When they sat outside my home and followed me and I seen a 2009 lynching. His skull was cracked in half. He had dog bites on his body. He was, he was lynched in this state. And these are modern day lynchings. It is not about being against police. It is a not about hating police. It is about right is right and wrong is wrong. We are aware that there are some good officers out there on the street, and I do believe that in my heart. But we must all be held accountable. It's time for us to come together as a people, as human beings, to do right by each other. Because it is only what we do for one another that's going to last in the end. Thank you. Uh, thank you, colleagues, for presenting that resolution. And I do want to just offer my sincere condolences once again to you, to Shara. And thank you for the work that you are doing supporting families who have experienced um, um, these losses as a result of police violence. So thank you so much. Um, and before we move to the next um, honorary resolution, I, I do just want to take a moment to acknowledge the challenges that we as a community, as a city, and as employees of the city of Minneapolis must grapple with and work together to affect the changes and the progress that we deserve. As we experience grief and mourning over the murder of George Floyd, as we have heard here today, of the many other lives impacted by police brutality. We are all here to do the hard work of systems change. Yesterday, the Minneapolis Black Employee Network and other city staff members convened the third annual Remembrance of George Floyd vigil and conversation. That was a brave and emotional and challenging space. I just wanna thank our dedicated staff who experienced the trauma as well and help to create this grounding space for, our, for our city employees to grieve. There's been a tremendous community impact. I live two blocks away from 38th in Chicago personally. And as a 20 year, 20 plus year resident of that community, I've been working all those years to really try to improve the quality of life at 38th in Chicago, long before um, the murder of George Floyd. And we will continue to work towards solutions rooted in healing and community development. And I'm confident that together we can get to a permanent memorial process that centers community and healing. I would be remiss if I didn't thank some of the people that are doing the hard work every day at George Floyd Square. I see you, I stand with you. And while I know this is not an exhaustive list, I wanna just shout out a few people, um, particularly Ethropic Burnett, who has led with compassion, care, and determination at George Floyd Square and recently was celebrated uh, with the well-deserved North Star Award. I wanna thank our community members, healers, caretakers, preservationists, and groups like the George Floyd Global Memorial. And I see Janelle Austin here today, and thank you. Um, 
I also heard your comments on NPR this morning, so thank you for continuing to uh, stand in this space and um, uplift this community in the ways that you do and preserve the, the images, the offerings, the artwork, the, the, the life that people are bringing to the square. I want to take a moment to thank our public work, works crew and staff who are working on the ground and really leading these difficult uh, processes to create projects that in, include really um, contentious community conversations and engagement. It takes all of us to come together and, um, and do this work. So with that in mind, I want to us to take a moment of silence. And that moment of silence, I'm going to ask the clerks to help me with the timing, um, a nine minute and 29 second moment of silence.
Thank you, everyone. Um, those that day, May 25th, 2020, uh, those nine minutes and 29 seconds were some of the most difficult nine minutes in my entire life. Um, and so next, oh, um, I, the chair will recognize Council Member Wansley as we prepare to uh, present the next resolution. Um, if the body would take a moment, um, I see, as you recognized earlier, Janelle Austin um, in the audience, who um, I would like to present her with the copy of the honorary resolution and to also allow her to share some comments um, as she's... Thank you, Janelle. Thank you for everything you do in the square on behalf of George Floyd's family for keeping and maintaining the sacredness of that space where we witnessed George Floyd be killed for nine minutes and 20, yeah. So I would like to present you with this resolution before we transition to the next because you deserve that recognition too. Those who aren't aware, um, Janelle Austin is one of the caretakers of George Floyd Square and the memorial, um, and just wanting to present you also with this resolution and allow you have the floor to share any comments that you think this body, our city, should hear at the moment. But I just wanted to also take the opportunity to honor the work that you've done and continuing the fight for justice, not just for George Floyd, but for so many who also haven't been recognized in the traditional justice way. So yeah, thank you so much, Sis, for being here. Um, I'm not gonna say much, um, but after that nine minutes and 29 seconds, I don't know if you all felt it, but it felt so cruel. that that could be done to another human being. We do what we do as a neighborhood, as a community, as a block, because we're just trying to do our part to end lynchings in America, that's it. We don't want anybody else's child, uncle, brother, sister, daughter, auntie, uncle, to be taken from them. We are trying to live into an imagination where black lives truly do matter and we can all live on the other side of justice together. That is all we are trying to do at George Floyd Square, regardless of all the different narratives that may be put out there. Our, our work, our work is to protect the narrative and to protect the legacy of resistance, which has been in effect for hundreds of years. Because we truly believe that we can be free. We truly believe that we can live life on the other side of justice. And so George Floyd Square still stands three years later, even though some of y'all never thought it would. But we as neighbors, we just took some time to get to know each other, center black voices, and decide, and decide that not in our backyard would there be any more lynchings. And we're trying our best. We don't always get it right. Probably make some of y'all mad. That's okay. But our goal our goal is to really set the stage for Minneapolis to lead this nation to end lynchings in America. That's why George Floyd Square still stands as protest. Thank you.
All right. I think this is hot. Can you guys hear me? Yes. So our next resolution yeah. our, our next resolution is um, declaring June 2023 lesbian, gay, trans, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirit, intersex, and asexual pride month. And I was going to invite all the members of SOGI to come up, and I see you all are here. So thank you. Maybe we can come, some can come on this other side as well. <laughs> are there other LGBTQIA plus 2S community members here or city employees? join us. Whereas, in 1975, Minneapolis was the first city in the state of Minnesota to prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, a position subsequently adopted by numerous Minnesota cities and the state itself. And, whereas, Minneapolis was the first city in the state of Minnesota to adopt an ordinance creating a domestic partner registry. And whereas the city of Minneapolis has been steadfast in its commitment to full legal equality for same-sex couples, and in particular, to end the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage, as well as a public and vocal proponent of the marriage equality statute passed in 2013 by the Minnesota State Legislator, Legislature and signed by the governor. And whereas the Minneapolis City Council in partnership with the Minneapolis School District, our legislative delegation and numerous advocacy organizations have long advocated for the 2014 passage of the Safe and Supportive Minnesota Schools Act providing a clear definition of bullying and focusing on bullying prevention. And whereas the City of Minneapolis Transgender Issues Work Group was established in March 2014 and has since hosted the annual Minneapolis Trans Equity Summit to support and continue to raise awareness of the social, legal, health, employment, and other issues critical to the transgender community and Whereas in 2015, same-sex marriage expanded to all 50 states in 2015 through various state court rulings, state legislation, popular, direct popular votes, and federal court rulings and. Whereas in January 2018, Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins and Councilmember Philippe Cunningham were sworn in as the first openly transgender council members elected to the Minneapolis City Council and the first, open, first two openly transgender people of color elected to any city council in the United States. And whereas in 2021, city employees organized to create a sexual orientation and gender identity employee resource group for people who identify as LGBTQ2 SIAP and allies who help drive diversity and inclusion strategy to ensure that we have a workforce that reflects the community we serve. And whereas in January 2022, myself, Councilmember Jason Chavez was sworn as the first LGBTQ Latinx council member elected to the Minneapolis City Council, and Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins was elected by her colleagues as the first openly transgender council president in the United States. And whereas Minneapolis has a thriving lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirit, intersex, and asexual community, sustaining and sustained by so many welcoming organizations, places of worship, businesses, neighborhoods, schools, events, and more. And whereas Minneapolis has benefited from the service of talents of numerous LGBTQ two-spirit um, SIA elected officials on the city council and park and recreational board and the board of estimate and taxation and in both the Minnesota House and Senate as well as countless appointed officials and the city employees. And whereas Minneapolis annually plays host to the Twin Cities LGBT Pride celebration and the city's largest outdoor festival in which Loring Park is turned into a forum for celebrating LGBTQ plus pride and those including allies who work for it. And whereas the United 
the United States Senate is view, reviewing the Equality Act, which would increase protections related to sexual orientation and gender identity to the city of Minneapolis, supporting its passage. Whereas, in December 2022, Mayor Jacob Fry signed an executive order which prohibits all city departments and city staff from taking any enforcement action against providers or individuals exercising their right to gender-affirming care in Minneapolis, the order, the order also affirms the right to minors living apart from their parents to make their own medical decisions regarding gender-affirming health care. Whereas in 2019, the city banned conversion therapy for minors, and earlier this year, Governor Tim Wall signed legislation to enshrine the right to gender-affirming care into law and other bans, um, and another ban of conversion therapy. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor and city council do hereby declare June as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, two-spirit, intersex, and asexual pride month in the city of Minneapolis, and that residents and visitors are encouraged to participate in the numerous activities celebrating LGBT um, QIA plus pride month in the city and in the ongoing work leading Minnesota towards full LGBTQ 2SIA equality. Thank you all for uh, being a part of this today and for creating the SOGI uh, group. And I would ask if anybody wants to share any words in this time that LGBTQIA plus communities are continuously under attack. Um, and Minnesota, I'm proud to say, is a safe haven for um, drag performers, for trans kids seeking affirmative, gender affirmative health care, for people with a womb seeking um, reproductive rights health care. This is a city that welcomes and affirms your identity, and I welcome anybody to share any thoughts or words. I did want to take this moment to call on Target Corporation to do better. They do have headquarters here in Minneapolis, and they recently are taking away some Pride merchandise from their stores across the nation. And I call on all corporations in our country that have been using rainbow capitalism to make a profit of our community, and now when their profits are in danger, they're taking away our own Pride merchandise. I think that is unacceptable. I think that we should be fighting against that. People should not make profits of our community, and then when we're a danger to their profits, they should not be taking that away. So that news broke out, I think, just yesterday and the day before that, and I wanted to make sure that this Pride Month we're fighting against that and standing up for all LGBTQ plus communities. Soji will be hosting a panel on June 21st at noon and it will be a panel of community leaders from uh, the LGBTQ plus community talking about how Minneapolis and Minnesota are a place that people are coming to from states in which some of these draconian laws have been made around trans and non-binary people because Minneapolis is seen as a safe place to be. And so we're gonna be hearing an update about what they're learning in the community and how we can do a good job in Minneapolis of welcoming people and how we can be a welcoming place. And that if we say we're welcoming, we should be. And so how can we do that? So we are all invited to join. It will be noon on the 10th floor training center in the public service building. You'll hear more, there will be more information. But it's an ongoing conversation. Things are just beginning to be learned about and resources are beginning to be developed and we hope you'll join. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you everyone for your patience. And I will now ask the clerk to call the roll to verify that we do have the presence of a quorum. Yes. Yes. Council Member Johnson. Here. Council Member Osman. Here. Council Member Payne. Present. Council Member Koski. Present. Council Member Shugtai. Present. Council Member Chavez. Present. Council Member Ellison. Here. Council Member Vita. Present. Council Member Rainville. Present. Council Member Goodman. Present. Council Member Wansley. Is absent. Vice President Palmasano. Present. President Jenkins. Present. There are 12 members present. Let the record reflect that we do have a quorum. Next, we have the adoption of our agenda, colleagues. The agenda for today's meeting is before us. I'll ask, are there any amendments to the agenda? Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> You might remember that uh, uh, I think a cycle ago I brought forward a legislative directed, uh, directed towards the clerks and the audit department uh, around FTEs and us getting some information and, and a little bit more transparency. Uh, and through some conversation with a few of my colleagues, including uh, Councilmember Koski and Wansley, I think we found some ways to strengthen that ask. And so we are here to um, uh, kind of resubmit the legislative directive uh, with a few additions, a few more specifics. and. Um, uh, and that's that's all. So you, it might look really familiar, but there's a few changes. And um, but it, 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 the, the spirit of it is still the same. We're looking for uh, this this information on how we're going about uh, approving and, and moving forward on new FTEs. So. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. And all those in favor of Councilmember Ellison's motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes and the agenda uh, is adopted as amended. Well, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the, the agenda is adopted as amended. Next item of business is acceptance of the minutes from our regular meeting on May 11th. May I have that motion, please? So moved. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and those minutes are accepted. Finally, we have the refer referral of petitions, <laughs> communications, and reports to the proper community. Committees might have that motion, please. So moved. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and those matters have been referred. The next order of business is reports from our standing committees beginning with the business inspections, housing, and zoning committee. And that report thankfully will be presented by Council Member Goodman. Good morning, Madam President, members of the council. I first want to announce, unfortunately, I'll need to leave immediately after my report uh, for the funeral of Council Member Pat Scott, who was the city council member who had this job immediately before me. Uh, she passed away in, uh, just a week or so ago, and her funeral is at um, St. Mark's Cathedral this morning, and I just feel it's very important for the city to show up for a former council member and wanted to mention it here as well. And thank you for your patience in allowing me to represent us in that way this morning. The biz committee is bringing forward 14 items for our approval this morning. Item one is snack bar. Item two is approving state of Minnesota assistance for the modular innovative solutions project. Item number three is a moratorium on certain high impact industrial uses. Item number four is granting an appeal on behalf of the armory holdings. Item five are the liquor license approvals and six are the renewals. Item number seven is a staff direction regarding um, excessively long vacancy in commercial and residential properties. Item eight is a grant agreement with MPHA for sprinklers. Item number nine is the Affordable Housing Trust Fund program updates. Item 10 are updates to our QAP. 
Item 11 is a rezoning at 3410 42nd Street East. And item number 12 is the land use um, 2040 ordinance changes. Item number 13 is approving a legislative directive surrounding uh, neighborhood serving commercial uses. And item 14 is also a legislative directive with regard to em environmental justice issues regarding the 2040 plan. So I'd like to move all items except for items 9 and 12, both for amendments and comments. So we'll start with all items but 9 and 12 and anything else anyone would like to pull. Thank you, um, Councilmember Goodman. And Councilmember Goodman has moved the committee's report um, except for items number 9 and 12. And um, are there any comments or questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll on um, that committee's report, except for items number nine and 12. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Osman. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. Um, that committee's report is uh, adopted. And um, now we will take up items number nine first, and then 12. Item number nine is the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And I recognize Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Council President Jenkins. I want to bring awareness to the lively discussion we had in the BIS committee. I know that staff had concerns with the amendments that Councilman Chuktai and I brought forward that prioritized more units in the scoring card for 30% AMI for folks that use vouchers and for folks that are homeless. I am bringing two motions forward today that I would like to move together as one package. The first is to revert back to staff recommendations but still including youth in the equitable criteria and the second, a legislative directive that would conduct a comparison of what the changes that the BIS committee, the majority of the BIS committee approved uh, last week and what it would have looked like with this new scoring criteria uh, with including scorecards, like a 2.5 increase in preservation. Last year, only 28% of our affordable housing units were for units of 30% of AMI or below. And that number has only decreased uh, with the ones that actually officially closed. I still stand with the work that the BIS committee moved forward with, but I am changing course today uh, to honor the work that staff did, which I do appreciate. When you represent a big community that is unhoused, that lives below the poverty line, is struggling with housing, you know that you can't just rubber stamp everything that comes before you in this body. Many of us got elected to prioritize those most in need, and I hope this sends a signal that this council believes in that path forward. I hope that we as a council address this issue and begin working with our community partners to increase our affordable housing stock at 30% AMI and for those most especially impacted. I expect big conversations on the scoring mechanisms before the year ends and as we head into 2023 to make sure that this council's priorities, the majority of it at least of this body, prioritizes this moving forward. So with that, I'll move approval of the two amendments that I have. If there's questions, I'm happy to answer them. I do want to say, though, that I think that this body, and I urge my colleagues to, to work together to figure out what we need to do, whether it's through our affordable housing trust fund, to figure out the mechanisms that we're going to do to increase our affordable housing supply. And when I say affordable housing, I mean for those units of 30% AMI or below. Thank you, Councilmember Chavez. Uh, the chair will recognize Councilmember Goodman. I'm sorry, Councilmember Ellison. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Just wanted to uh, thank my colleague, Councilmember Chavez. Um, you know, I was a supporter of the initial amendment, and I think that it, uh, through some discussion, it, it, it takes a, a lot of leadership. It takes a lot of courage to both assert uh, the values that Councilmember Chavez was asserting in, in, in that meeting and, and as a council member, uh, but also to recognize when you're dealing with a highly technical issue and you need just a, a little bit more information to proceed forward in the way that you want and to make sure that you're getting the outcomes that you want. And I think that that's what Councilmember Chavez um, and Shugdai are doing here. Um, and so just wanted to, to name that and uh, appreciate the, uh, the, the, the conversation that we've had um, and, uh, and I'll be supporting this motion today. Councilmember Goodman. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I also support the uh, amendment that Councilmember Chavez has brought forward this morning. But I want to first start by thanking staff and all of the folks in the community that are actually doing this work on a daily basis to build this very important resource for our residents, which is affordable housing. One of the main changes staff made in the staff recommendation was to offer a points for 30% units and then to offer more points for more 30% units. So it's important to know that this change was made based on the staff recommendation, and I'm not sure that that was explained well enough in the presentation, which is potentially what uh, caused this ripple effect of making a change that would have added points for 30% units without asking for more 30% units. That's the place we're at right now. That is what Council Member Chavez is supporting today. The second um, point I want to make is adding youth to the list for threshold criteria, I believe is a really good change because I spent a good part of my career um, working at on uh, YouthLink, uh, housing for 40 homeless youth. And this is a population that is often left out of the prioritization. And I think it's really important to rise up that population because if we can start early housing young people, um, hopefully they will have a life of housing, not a life of homelessness. So I think that's a very good change and I'm supportive of it. Ultimately, in the end, um, we can rank them both ways and I think that um, the truth will come out. But one thing to be aware of is that in this very complicated funding strategy. Some funds can only be used for some uses and some funds for other uses. So a big chunk of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is community development block grant money that can only be spent on preservation. So we have a, a built-in set aside essentially for preservation as a result of the funding source. Um, and so I think it's okay to analyze adding some points for that, but the fact that you can't use that money for new construction basically drives a funding source um, for preservation, including projects like Heritage Park and Little Earth, which are in need of preservation funding in this round as almost an immediate situation. So I just wanted to note that I think the staff have done an incredible job. I appreciate the exercise everyone's gone through to understand that the scoring is a statement of our values. It's also a statement of what we're asking developers to do and the big change made, made by staff in this cycle was you get extra points if you build extra 30% units. You don't just get points for building 30% units anymore. That's the baseline. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Goodman. Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I too will, will vote for this. And uh, Councilmember Chavez, thank you for uh, this extra transparency and uh, recognizing our staff involvement, as well as the involvement of the developers and other government agencies. I see Director Brennan there, your staff has done a great job pushing this along and we look forward to more information. Uh, I also want to thank the faith community who are here today. Uh, we really appreciate all you're doing and uh, bear wish with us on the, be patient. You know, this is a great idea. We just have to go through a little bit more. It'll still be a great idea at the end of the day. So thank you for coming down today. And last of all, uh, thank you, Councilmember Goodman, your, your wisdom in guiding us through this process. You do a great job as chair of that committee. So. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Councilmember Rainville. Seeing no further discussion, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on item number nine. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 13 ayes. That carries and that item is adopted. The next item is item number 12. The next item is item number 12. Uh, and um, it is a, I believe, <laughs> Thank you, Madam Council President. Member, Item number 12 is the long-awaited and much-needed ability for the city, city to fulfill its obligation to eliminate the conflicts between our current 2040 plan, zoning code, and comp plan. I never thought I would see the day where I would have my name on as an author for anything associated with 2040, so I first want to thank our staff for doing incredible work. 
I believe in you and the work that you've done, so much so that I put my name on this plan, despite the level of misinformation that has been out there with regard to what the uh, land use rezoning study is doing at this moment. Um, it has been a terrible stressor for the planning staff and, and system to have so many changes have to come through because we were not able to uh, get this portion of the plan done. And I'm very happy we're at a point now where we're just simply focusing on what uses are allowed within each of the different categories. Everybody did not get what they want. I would have liked to make changes too, and I will have to get in line with everyone else who would like to make a comp plan change. But we are getting a big chunk of work done, hopefully taking some pressure off of our staff and the planning divisions, you know, the Board of Adjustment, the Planning Commission, and ultimately the committee that half of us serve on, uh, so we won't see as many appeals. Um, so we're, I'm going to move this forward, but I do want to note that Council Member Ellison, who has done a massive amount of work on the environmental justice portions of this plan, and he's been very engaged in this for a long period of time, has a small amendment to Section 525.420, Section 3. You all have it in front of you. It adds the words, a principal electricity generated use or generation use. I don't know, if you, do you want to speak to this, sir? I'm going to go ahead and move the amendment and also then move the main motion on item number 12. Go ahead. Well, I'll second that if it needs a second. Yeah. And thank you, uh, Councilmember Goodman. And, um, and yeah, it's a small change. Uh, I want to thank, again, staff for really um, diving deep. You know, these can be very technical things. You know, you can... You can try to make a change and, and not understand that, that the change that you're making, especially with something that comes around every 10 years or so. And so, um, uh, you know, I really felt passionate about diving into this environmental justice work and figuring out where it was appropriate in the land use rezoning study to, to, to make those changes. I had a lot of help from community members, uh, some of whom are here. I had a lot of support from staff helping me understand the document. So um, thank you to staff. Thank you to community members who helped educate me on this. And I'm happy to make this change. Um, and uh, and um, that's all, so thanks. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak to this specific motion? Councilmember Osmond? Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and thanks, uh, good, uh, Chair Goodman, uh, for, uh, for that. I do have a question. I think uh, the staff uh, did everything they can to educate me and uh, explain this process. And also some of my residents of uh, Ventura Village had great ideas uh, they had in mind uh, that I talked to the staff about. And um, I know I'm not bringing any amendments, anything like that, but I do want to um, ask if uh, the changes that are taking place today, if, if there will be opportunity for council members or even residents for bringing ideas to, uh, to add it in the future or to add what goes in there or what not, uh, or is this is just uh, you can answer that. I, I'll try yeah. to answer. Council member. Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The plan is a living, breathing document. And so we will always be looking at what kinds of technical mistakes there might have been, what kinds of policy mistakes there might have been. Just in today's agenda, we already approved two things that we're looking at as it pertains to comprehensive plan amendment changes. Uh, so it, it's, an, it's an iterative document. And so, I mean, we're not looking to like add 20 changes to it in the next six months. We kind of want to see how it plays out. But of course, the council's always open and encouraged to look at changes. We've looked at, um, you know, from serving on the committee, we've determined that alleys that are Properties that don't have alleys might be too close to other properties, and so there could be a problem with that. We'll look at that. So staff is keeping a long list of potential changes, and it, this is not the final say. It's just the final um, culmination of a lot of work on many, many different um, portions of this plan to get us to a working document where we can continue to do our work. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions specifically on Councilmember Ellison's motion or comments? I'm not seeing any. Let's ask the clerk to please first call the roll on Councilmember Ellison's. Motion. I move them both. Uh, you're moving them both? I'm moving the Ellison amendment with the main motion at the same vote. All right. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. 
Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins is absent. There are 12 ayes. Thank you. That carries. That item is adopted. Congratulations. That was an enormous body of work, and thank you to staff for all of your assistance. Um, next is the Committee of the Whole, and that report will be presented by its Vice Chair, Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Vice President Palmasano. Uh, we are bringing one item forward. It's the Minnesota Department of Human Rights Settlement Agreement Fiscal Analysis that has two items. A legislative director requesting a comprehensive fiscal analysis of the potential costs and impacts of the MDHR settlement agreement and a request to the city auditor to conduct an analysis of the operating and fiscal impacts that can be expected as a result of the MDHR settlement agreement. I move for approval. Thank you. Vice Chair Chavez has moved approval of the committee's report. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shebtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vitov. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Goodman is absent. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. I do want to thank uh, Council Vice President and Councilmember Chavez for helping me out while I attended to my <laughs> biology. And uh, our next committee report is the Policy Government Oversight Committee, uh, and it will be presented by the chair, Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> the Policy and Government Oversight Committee is bringing forward 21 items for approval. Uh, one is a gift acceptance for the Minnesota uh, section of the American Water Works Association of Registration, Travel, and Lodging Expenses. Two is gift acceptance from the Minnesota State Association of Narcotics Investigators of Registration and Lodging Expenses. Three is a gift acceptance from the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension of Travel Expenses. Four is a gift acceptance from the National Association of Counties and Cities Health Officials of Travel and Lodging Expenses. Five is acceptance from the Minneapolis uh, K Police Canine Foundation of dual purpose uh, police dogs. Uh, six is a gift acceptance from Joseph uh, Mueller of a canine uh, dog, Kobe. Uh, and seven is a gift acceptance um, from the Goldenrod Collaborative of per diem and hotel expenses. Real quick, I do wanna say that if folks are noticing a considerable spike in gift acceptances, and the clerks can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's because we're trying to consolidate those through one committee. I think before you would get just a few in every committee, so it never really seemed like there were that many, uh, but that's the explanation of that. We're not all of a sudden getting a huge surge in gift acceptances overall, is my understanding. All right, uh, eight is a, a bid for liquid chlorine. Nine is a bid for the 2023 Vision Zero project. 10 is a bid for convention center ceiling and lighting upgrade uh, phase four project. 11 is a contract with Weiland Associations LLC for Supplemental Emergency Operations Center staffing. 12 is a contract with election systems and software for purchase of in-person early voting ballot on demand printing equipment. 13 is a contract amendment with Northside Economic Opportunity Network or NEON for workspace at 10, uh, 1007 West Broadway Avenue. Uh, 14 is a contract amendment with Minnesota State Colleges and Universities through Century College for fire cadet training and education services. 15 is a contract amendment with uh, Lynch Record Services, Inc. for public towing services. 16 is a contract amendment for the language services pool for interpretation and translation services. 17 is a contract amendment with Axon uh, Enterprise, Inc. for body-worn cameras and licensing for the police department. 18 is a contract amendment with CenturyLink Communications, LLC for telecommunication services. 19 is a contract amendment with Good Works Consulting LLC for continued delivery of the Metamorphosis Senior Leadership Development Program. 20 is the 2021 Local Board of Appeal and Equalization Report. And 21 is a contract amendment with Robert Half International Inc. for temporary staffing services for the Public Safety Public Data Practices Project, which we got an update on, um, and it was um, uh, very informative and, and good news. So with that, I will move approval of all these items. Councilmember Ellison has moved this committee's report. Are there any comments or questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, um, I will just note on item number 19 that um, contract amendment with Good Works Consulting LLC 
is really to uh, continue our anti-racism training uh, through March 31st, 2025. I think this is important work for the city to be engaged in, and so I just wanted to point that out. And seeing no further comments, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Allison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and that report is adopted. The next report is our Public Health and Safety Committee, which will be presented by the chair, Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward five items. Item one is authorizing a grant application to FEMA for targeted violence and terrorism prevention. Item two is appointing Health Commissioner Damone Chaplin to serve as the Community Health Services Administrator on behalf of the city's Community Health Board. Item three is accepting a grant from the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum for the 2023 Food Policy and Climate Action Cohort. Item four is accepting a Project Safe Neighborhood Grant from the Bureau of Justice Assistance to assist sworn investigators. And item six is authorizing contracts with organizations for partnership engagement fund. I will move approval of these items. Council member Vitao has moved this committee's report. Is there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. Finally, we have the report from the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee presented by the Chair, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Works and Infrastructure Committee is bringing 10 items forward today. The first is the Stormwater Management Program and Annual Report. Items two and three are uh, large block event permits uh, for Pride. Item number four is a subordinate funding agreement for Metro Green Line Extension Project. Item number five is a layout approval for Second Street South Pedestrian Safety Improvement Project. Item number six is an agreement with XL Energy for Hennepin Avenue South Street reconstruction. Item number seven is the biennial route maintenance agreement with MnDOT. Item number eight are the city's comments for the F-Line Bus Rapid Transit Corridor Plan, recommended corridor plan. Item number nine is a resolution uh, honoring Public Works Week and item number 10 is an obstruction permit fees update. I will go ahead and move the committee's full report and all those items. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. And Councilmember Johnson has moved that committee's report. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osmond. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries, and that report is adopted, and um, that completes the reports from our standing committees. Our next order of business is resolutions, and we have two honorary resolutions that were read at the beginning of the meeting. Are there any further comments uh, from my colleagues, Council Member Wansley? Thank you, uh, Madam President. Um, I know often we don't do acknowledgement of all of the great staff that who support or who supports us in doing this legislative work and serving the the residents, you know, that in our respective wards and across the city. Um, but I really just want to take an opportunity to acknowledge um, the labor um, and, and labor of love um, and support that both um, Council Member Chavez uh, staff as well as my own staff uh, poured into making sure that we brought forward um, this very 
timely honorary resolution around honoring the victims of police brutality um, and also supporting the families um, who uh, came and received them. I'm sorry that uh, we missed it, but several of George Floyd's relatives also came um, a couple of minutes after we wrapped up and they relayed their gratitude for this body, acknowledging those harms as what was echoed by Toshira Galloway. Um, so I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge um, our staff who also poured a lot of work into making sure um, this resolution came forward and for our families to join us this morning to receive that resolution. So just wanted to share that and thank you all to my colleagues who supported that uh, resolution as well. Thank you, Councilmember Wansley. I um, wholeheartedly agree and would offer uh, my thanks and gratitude to all of the staff, including my own, who, who worked diligently on the second resolution that we presented today, but who stand in the gap and do this work each and every day to support the constituents and residents of the city of Minneapolis. Um, are there any other um, comments regarding those resolutions? Seeing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council member. Or, so I'm sorry, I'll entertain a motion to adopt these resolutions. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> clerk, please call the roll. Council member Johnson. Aye. Council member Osmond. Aye. Council member Payne. Aye. Council member Koski. Aye. Council member Shugtai. Aye. Council member Shabbos. Aye. Council member Ellison. Aye. Council member Vita. Aye. Council member Rainville. Aye. Council member Wansley. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries those resolutions have been adopted. The next order of business is a motion under new business today, and I will uh, recognize Council Member Chug Tai to introduce her staff directive relating to the rent stabilization policy. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this motion before you today uh, is regarding rent stabilization policy. Um, rent stabilization is an issue that city policymakers have been working on for years. This is uh, truly a long time coming. In October 2019, the City Council voted to commission an economic impact analysis evaluating rent stabilization as a component of housing policy. That eventually produced what we now know as the CURA study um, on rent stabilization, which was presented to the council in a study session in February of 2021. In August 2021, the council and mayor approved a rent stabilization charter amendment in the form of ballot question three um, to put on the ballot for voter consideration. The voters approved this charter amendment in November of 2021. Following that, in April 2022, this body created the rent stabilization work group a body of 25 members to deliberate on this issue and provide the council with recommendations of a rent stabilization policy framework. Its members were approved at the end of July and included important stakeholders like renters, landlords, affordable housing providers, developers, and financial interests. The work group met from September through December of last year, and at the end of their deliberations, they voted with a 56% majority voting in favor to recommend framework five to this body. Then on April 18th, uh, staff came to the council's business inspections, housing and zoning committee to present their analysis of the work group's recommendation, um, along with an analysis of framework seven, which as we know was not recommended by the work group. Um, it, this uh, discussion continued to the following meeting, and we spent approximately three hours of the biz committee's time devoted to discussing this issue uh, over the last few weeks. This city council, the city council has conducted a robust and extensive process to get to this point on a rent stabilization policy. This process has included policymakers, it has included stakeholders, and most importantly, it has included the residents that we all serve who live in this city. Now, it's time for us to take some next steps. As uh, Clerk Carl outlined in the May 2nd biz meeting, our staff is now waiting for this body to give them a direction on policy so that they can draft the ordinance and ballot language. This motion before you today has been vetted by the city clerk's office and the city attorney's office. 
Um, it's important to understand how sensitive the timeline for action on this issue is. Because of state law, any final policy has to be put back on the ballot for approval by the voters. Last year, we considered a path that allowed the council to deliberate on the policy and put something on the ballot last year. That was not the direction that we felt comfortable going in yet. Instead, we created a work group and our wanted industry experts and stakeholders to make policy recommendations to us. And our intention was always to take their recommendation, move it through the council's legislative process and put it on the ballot for voters to make the final decision. For us to do that this year, we have to send finalized ballot language to Hennepin County by August 25th for the ballots to be printed in time. With how many meetings we have left between now and that deadline, um, we, have, we, we are out of time. And that means should this item pass today, at our next council meeting on June 15th, we would give notice of introduction to introduce an ordinance related to this matter. Then at our council meeting on June 28th, we would do the first reading and referral to biz committee. Um, after that, at the June, July 11th biz committee meeting, we would potentially set a public hearing for the following meeting and refine the ordinance, assuming that this draft, which is based on this motion, is ready um, for uh, consideration. Then um, on July 25th, we would potentially hold a public hearing and consider amendments and refinement. There would be a lot of opportunity for any member to bring amendments for consideration um, to refine the policy. And because of the significance of the policy, both for the city and for residents, we may need to continue to do amendments and refinements um, to the ordinance at our August 8th biz committee meeting. And if not, the refined policy would be advanced to the August 3rd council meeting where we would have another opportunity for every policymaker here to amend and refine um, the ordinance before it goes to the mayor. And if the policy remains in the biz committee for a second meeting, then it would come to the August 17th meeting where again, we would have the opportunity um, for amendments and refinement. August 17th is the last scheduled meeting before the deadline to put something on the ballot this year. Um, to be clear, this motion is not final policy. It directs the city attorney's office to draft ordinance language, which would ultimately need to go through our regular ordinance creation process. That means this body will have multiple opportunities to influence the outcome. I, um, I, me and council member Osman based this motion off of the experts recommendation, both um, from the Cura research and the rent stabilization work groups recommendation. We understand that not every policymaker or stakeholder agrees with that. That is okay. If you dislike components of this policy, let's work together on refining it to make it work for this body and for residents. If you're concerned about having the opportunity to shape the finalized product, rest assured that there are going to be plenty of opportunities for that in the coming months in our ordinance creation process, both at the committee and council level. And then I just wanted, because this is a, a new process and way of policymaking that this body is experiencing right now, um, I just had a couple of questions to direct to the clerk, um, if that's okay with you. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, um, Clerk Carl, like knowing again that this is an unfamiliar process for all of us, um, can you please add any information I may have missed about, um, about the process? And can you share the impact of this body potentially advancing a motion that doesn't include specific um, components of the policy, share why a motion is needed for the city attorney's office to draft an ordinance, and specifically why um, an individual council, council member can't just um, ask our attorneys to work with us to draft something. And then finally, um, can you and or the city attorney um, clarify why the council is able to direct the city attorney's office while we cannot direct other departments or staff in the administration. Uh, Madam President, to Councilmember Shugtai's question, I think you did an excellent job, Councilmember, of summarizing the process. So I, I would start by saying, as you have said, 
the action that is presented today is merely a motion that um, sets forward a framework, a possible framework for the development of a policy on rent stabilization that this body could consider. That framework then sets out directions specific to the city attorney on what should be included in the policy and by extension what should not be. Um, that ensures that this pre-work at the beginning of the process has a majority of the council in support of the basic tenets of what would be a rent stabilization policy in the form of an ordinance. Uh, so that before they begin drafting work that may or may not ultimately come to fruition with a majority vote, that time isn't wasted. As you pointed out, we are under a very strict statutory time uh, period that we may not uh, affect. And so by August 25th, we must, if a question is to go to the voters this year, take final action. <clears throat> and that includes not only a final action by this body, <clears throat> excuse me, but also consideration by the mayor and any reaction by the council if there's a veto. So all of that has to be planned into the schedule before August 25th and working with you, as you've outlined quite well, there will literally be an action every cycle from now until that time. Um, the motion that we put in front of you is to provide that direction to make sure that from the beginning, in full transparency, both to all the policymakers in the body as well as the public who you represent, there is clarity about what is the actual policy you're advancing and putting forward. That would be very important, of course, for the public if they're going to have any meaningful impact at all at a public hearing stage, that the draft ordinance provide those details. Um, you asked, could we put forward an ordinance, for example, that had sort of blanks that could be filled in later? What meaning would be provided by that? The, the details are in those blanks. And so, for example, a, a cap, the specific that is in the cap needs to be in the draft that's shared with the public so that the public can provide meaningful input to the body before we take final action. As you pointed out, that doesn't stop the body itself from refining and perfecting the process. But at this initial stage, all stakeholders, internal and external to the city, are going to know what that draft policy would, would include as it comes out of the very first step. So I think that would explain why I think that's important um, and why this is different. I will also say this is allowing us to pilot, if you will, the reformed legislative process we've already talked to in front of this body publicly. That part of the process in the past has been there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes, not visible or accessible to the public. This puts that work in the public sphere, in the council chamber, in full view of everyone. So I think that's also uh, an important to make. Um, and then I think you asked about why you are able to direct the city attorney specifically, but not others in the administration. I'll start and certainly will defer to the city attorney because we're speaking about her role. Mm -hmm. But as we've talked about for the last year and a half on government structure, the city attorney of all 25 departments is unique and is unlike any other department. The city attorney is by city charter named the attorney for the city as an enterprise. The city attorney is the attorney for the mayor, for the city council, for all city departments, and for all city boards and commissions with the one exception of the park board of, of commissioners. Um, and so because of that, we have to be careful, are, are we the body, are you the body, talking to the, the attorney in her capacity as your attorney, or are you talking to her in the capacity as the city's attorney that's under the administration of the mayor? In this case, you're giving direction to your attorney to do work that is well within the legislative sphere, legislative drafting of a policy. So that's why this is somewhat different, and I did consult with the attorney on should this be in the form of a legislative directive, how this body connects to the administration through the mayor, or should it be some other form? As when you direct your clerk and your auditor, it's a motion. Um, and that's why it presented today as a motion. It's a motion directing the attorney. But again, defer to and uh, attorney Anderson on more specifics about the nature of her role. I, I hope I answered all those questions. Uh, and uh, council president, members of the, the committee, or I mean of the, of the council, uh, Clerk Carl is 100% right, and if you if you recall the legislative directive policy that that this body adopted uh, earlier in uh, I, I guess it was 2022, now explicitly excluded from the policy requests for legal assistance from the office of the city attorney for exactly this sort of thing because as Clerk Carl stated under the charter, uh, the city attorney is the attorney for the city writ large and exclusively the attorney for the city. And so in terms of being the, the council as a body being able to get your uh, ordinances drafted, that is that that is the legal work of, of the city attorney's office. And so it's really not appropriate 
uh, as with other departments, when you're going through the mayor with a legislative directive, when, when you are asking the city attorney's office to do that very specific legal work for you as the body, um, it, you, you come to us directly and, and through this motion process. Uh, thank you, City Attorney and Clerk Carl. I will now recognize Councilmember Osman. Thank you so much, Madam President. And I want to thank Councilmember Aisha Chuktai for her work. Uh, this is something that is important to our residents. Housing is a human right. And one thing we cannot do is stay quiet and not move forward. I think residents have spoken through the uh, pro ballot process where they passed for council members to discuss and have a conversation about this. Um, I know we're running out of time, but one thing we cannot do is just um, stay quiet. Uh, our residents expect us to do something and at least discuss and bring something forward. And we were a we, we hired a work group. We spent money for this work group to meet three months to come up some suggestions and they came up framework seven, five and seven. And this bullet points that we made can be changed. And that's the process uh, we're talking about. We wanna be able to say what is the best way forward to move, what's the best way to move forward uh, being a pro renter and making sure that we are creating, um, you know, more opportunity for people to stay their homes. Um, you can use an example of Ward 6. We have encampments everywhere in Ward and they continue getting evicted um, and moving around, moving around. Uh, summer, winter, doesn't matter what the weather is. We live in a very advanced country and nobody should be living in this kind of condition. And we gotta think about the future of our residents in Minneapolis and uh, rent stabilization is a great tool to use it. So let's discuss it, let's move forward and bring your best uh, you know, ideas that you have on this process that we have. Again, thank you so much, Councilmember Aisha Chuktai for your work. Um, and she also knows that I don't believe that we should start with these components, so I won't be voting for it today. Uh, I am supportive of a rent stabilization policy that prote protects against price gouging and unreasonable and predatory rent increases, one that protects our most vulnerable residents and works in partnership with all of our other initiatives to build and preserve affordable housing of all types. What I cannot support is a policy with no flexibility or one that eliminates development in our city which means we aren't replacing the affordable housing we're losing to age or to a growing population. Um, rent control has to strike a balance between protecting renters from unreasonable practices and not becoming an impediment to new housing. As we face a nationwide housing crisis, the last thing we need is less access to housing. St. Paul has made significant changes to their voter approved rent control policy after development screeched to a halt in their city, they were forced to acknowledge that an inflexible policy provided real challenges and additional burdens on renters. So I think we need a targeted approach with any policy in Minneapolis, and I am committed to ensuring we take the time to craft that approach and get real and practical to help our city's renters. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Next in queue is Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I do want to say that I'll be supporting this motion today, and I want to thank Council Members Chiktai and Osmond for uh, for leading on this and getting us here. I do want to say, you know, we've got to start with some kind of baseline. We've got to start with some kind of specifics, and you know, uh, like with any policymaking pr um, process, uh, there will be plenty of moments for discussion. There'll be plenty of moments for uh, changing the policy along the way, and so, um, you know, given that Council Member. Chiktai and Osmond worked on this policy. They put a framework that they support and, 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 and said that we should start from there. 
That does not mean that this is the final framework. It doesn't mean that this cannot be amended. It doesn't mean that we can't get new information. And so I do think we should support this today, especially given that um, there is so much flexibility between here and getting this on the ballot. Uh, I do support the framework that they've laid out here, but I also understand that not everyone on the body does. And I just want to reassure folks that there is flexibility in this process. Um, and uh, lastly, uh, you know, again, it's, it's, um, Timing is, 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 is critical here, uh, and so given that, this is really a question about whether we're going to take this up this year or not, and I think that, uh, I think that we should take this up this year. Uh, and so, uh, again, thank you to my colleagues for, for bringing this forward, and uh, I'll, be supporting, um, I'll be supporting it. Thank you, Councilmember. Next in queue is Councilmember Chavez. Uh, Council President Jenkins, thank you. I want to begin by saying thank you to Councilmember Chuck Tai and Councilmember Osman for bringing this motion forward and wanted to give a little data uh, in my ward as it regards to this policy. In 2021, 70.82% of my ward voted in favor of authorizing the City Council to regulate rents on private residential property in the City of Minneapolis by ordinance. And then 29.18% voted no. And this doesn't even include the undocumented community members in my ward that cannot vote, but fundamentally believe that we need a rent stabilization policy right now. Folks that cannot vote, that support this policy, desperately need it right now. I wanted to repeat that because that is one of the most vulnerable communities we have in the entire city and state. And the rising rents that they're being forced to deal with is leaving many homeless, many without food, and many without the resources that they desperately need. The ninth ward is the most racially diverse ward in the entire city of Minneapolis. So this data should not surprise anyone that people of color fundamentally believe that we need rent control now. Our communities of color and immigrants and families are being squeezed from all their money while the people on top continue to profit off our backs. I spent a lot of time on these doors, and my constituents fundamentally believe, at least in Ward 9 they do, that housing is a human right and that people deserve to stay in their homes. But they also believe that we need to do more as a city. We need rent control now, but we also need a tenant opportunity to purchase. We also need more funding for the right to counsel, and we need to increase who actually qualifies for it, because right now, it doesn't qualify for the people that need it the most. We need a public housing levy, and we need to hold predatory landlords accountable. Thank you, Councilmember Osman. Thank you, Councilmember Chuck Tai, for your courage to bring this forward. Thank you, Councilmember. Next in queue is Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Councilmember Chuck Tai and Osman for bringing this motion forward. Um, I have always supported passing a strong rent control policy with a 3% uh, cap and no exemptions or no exceptions, um, because that is the policy that will protect the most vulnerable renters in our city and actually rein in the out of control housing market without loopholes for developers and corporate landlords to exploit. Over the last year, there have been attempts to delay, sidetrack, and discredit a rent control policy from moving forward. But as many of my <laughs> colleagues have shared uh, so far, you know, at this point, it's really a question of political will, um, and it's a political decision. Either we move forward with framework five or we don't. Um, we, as elected officials, are ultimately responsible for taking a stance on policy issues. And I support framework five because I believe that is the right policy for our city. And after a year of convoluted delays, renters just deserve a straight answer about whether this council is going to move forward with a strong rent control policy or not. Um, but I want to name our residents have been clear of what they want to see us do. Over seven, 76,000 residents uh, voted in uh, 2021 to give this body a mandate to pass rent control. The work group that we formed also supported a strong uh, policy in framework five. I will also name in my ward the student government of the University of Minnesota formally supported framework five. I also want to briefly address the mischaracterizations that we often hear about the impacts of rent control, especially those that's grounded in what took place in St. Paul. I want to be very clear of 
the pulling out of developers um, in St. Paul from producing units, that was a capital strike. That was intentionally used to make sure that elected officials who are actually beholden or attempting to be beholden to their residents and addressing our unaffordable housing market um, and you know wanting to move forward with modest regulations, that was an attempt to put them in their place and to stall any movement or any policy development that actually regulated our current unaffordable housing market. So that was an intentional capital strike. We heard the same thing with the 15 minimum wage several years ago where businesses like Target came all up inside of City Hall and said the sky was going to fall and zombies would take over the city if we pass a minimum wage policy that would end poverty wages for workers. And I already know we got in a couple of weeks uh, the Federal Reserve is going to give a presentation that's literally saying the same thing 10 years later and people need more than 15 at this moment. But di I divert. Um, that We often hear Profit-driven interests always saying regulations that actually protect people than profits is going to harm them because they're seeing it as a threat to their profits. But we're not here to serve the interests of those who only want to cultivate and create pockets, I mean profits. We're here to serve our residents. And I also want to know in St. Paul, after that capital strike, those developers came back. 2022 was a record year for the development of multifamily housing construction permits in St. Paul. So let's ground our discussion, you know, as we move forward with this in the facts. Um, I also just want to name again, exemptions and exceptions are bad for renters. I can speak for war too. We have an extremely high turnover near the U, which means that vacancy decontrol would exempt massive amounts of housing in my ward. Same with new construction. Exempting recent construction would, me would mean nearly half of some neighborhoods in war two would be completely unprotected from rent gouging or rent hikes. So it's very clear, we need a strong policy that protects renters. And that means a 3% with no exemptions or exceptions, period. And I extend gratitude to council members, Chuck Ty and Osmond for kickstarting the legislative process that will help us to hopefully deliver that strong policy that residents have been looking to this body to deliver for several years now. So thank you. Uh, thank you, and I did have myself in queue, but I will recognize Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam President. I wanted to echo some of the sentiments that Council Member Chavez shared. Uh, we need this policy. We need this now. Uh, we need to start this timeline to get this policy on the ballot this year. And it's not the only policy we need to protect renters. And it's not the only policy we need to have a healthy housing market in the city of Minneapolis. And right now, we have a fully dysfunctional housing market. Uh, and that's clear whether you're a renter or shopping for a home. It, something is not working in our city and something's not working in our country when it comes to housing policy. And so if we want to fix that, we need to bring every tool to the table. Uh, I think rent control is a really foundationally important tool, but it's not the only thing that we need right now to solve our housing crisis. And I think, you know, in my conversations with, you know, some of the most, um, skeptical stakeholders in this conversation, that being some of our developers. Uh, we saw from the Cura study that uh, a cap on rents of 3% wouldn't really be a threat to their business model. They don't frequently raise rents more than 3%. But for some of our most marginalized community, th those numbers are out of control. And so the worry that the developers have are around access to capital. And the, as Council Member Wansley is discussing, capital strike that might happen when institutional investors are spooked away by uh, elected people who put their residents first. And I think the answer to that is to not, not, the answer to that isn't to not pass a policy. The answer to that is to solve it with more policy. And I think that we need to take a, a stronger role in these capital decisions and have something like a municipal bank so that we can actually fund these developments in a way that the private market is just uninterested in because the profits aren't what they want it to be. So I think we need to just usurp that and put put ourselves at the uh, uh, in the driving seat when it comes to our housing market. And I think it's possible to do that through something like a municipal bank. And I'll also echo um, my colleague, Councilmember Ellison, of today we are voting on moving forward. We're not making hard commitments, but we need to have something to start with and we've already asked so much of our community through bringing together the work group. It was a very thoughtful cross-section of our community and cross-section of stakeholders. This is our starting point. 
let's get this ball rolling. We can do the work of policymakers through this formal process, and we we have to start now if we want to make that deadline this year. So I'm going to be supporting this policy, and I'm going to be encouraging the rest of my colleagues to support this policy. And I'll echo my colleague, uh, Councilmember Goodman. Today is not the day to do the work of, of committee work. Today is the day to start the process so we can do that work. And I think a vote on, a vote on this is a vote to continue working on this policy so that we can deliver for our community this year. Thank you, Councilmember Payne. And um, I will just state that um, I'm grateful for Councilmember Chuck Tai and Osmond bringing this um, motion forward today to begin the process. We absolutely do need to get something on the ballot this year so that our voters can weigh in on this. Um, it certainly is an opportunity for us to shape this policy. Um, and so I will be supporting this motion today and um, looking forward to the robust discussions that we are going to have moving forward in the future. Um, I now see Council Member Johnson has joined the queue. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, and I, uh, want to say thank you to the authors for their work uh, related to this uh, and their willingness to bring forward something on rent stabilization. I certainly am interested in seeing a policy pass uh, and seeing rent stabilization in our city, and I would like to see something this year. I don't support Framework 5. Uh, I want to recognize the Home to Stay Coalition and Isaiah for all the work they've done around trying to build a consensus. It's my understanding that they're just from conversations of elected officials that they've made from the coalition that there uh, was a 3% policy that would have more support on this council than I think we will see today. And that policy could have been the one being brought forward. Uh, I also wish that we had had more conversations around this. I know that uh, one of the authors I spoke to several months ago, briefly for a few minutes in my office, uh, the other one called me yesterday to have a direct conversation for the first time about this. Uh, I hope that we can start having more conversations as well as this body tries to build consensus. Uh, I don't support version uh, framework five for a number of reasons. And all those reasons relate to it being bad for tenants, for renters. The first is it will reduce supply creation by adding risk to new construction projects. It will lead to unit destruction by creating market asymmetries that result in sub-market returns. It will create it will, frankly, increase rent for renters by incentivizing all landlords to maximize the rent increases, particularly because of the no banking, to the full amount, 3%, which on a $1,000 a month unit is an additional $360 a year, which is a huge amount of money that's uh, comparable uh, in many cases to several weeks, if not a month of groceries for an individual. And between the impacts it will have on both demand and also the exceptions around large capital expenditures being passed through, uh, passed, passed through, it will fuel gentrification. Those are serious concerns I have about Framework 5. I believe we can move forward a policy that does the most to maximize protections for renters without creating these unintended consequences. And I hope that there's work after this today to have those direct conversations. And I uh, trust my colleagues will engage around that and, and do that work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Next in queue is Councilmember Rainbill. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Councilmember Johnson, very well spoken. Uh, I will also be voting no on this today. And, and I do appreciate the authors bringing this forward. Uh, but when we talk about 
a, a capitalization strike. That's a very real, real issue. And that happened in St. Paul. And it was not until there were great modifications made to their rent policy that the building became again. And money in, in this day and age can be moved around very rapidly. And, and people will not invest in housing in our community if they are not allowed their rate of return. That's why you're seeing all the building in Denver, Albuquerque, that money just won't come here anymore. So I look forward to the discussion and I, I appreciate the, the democracy and the transparency that discussion will happen. But uh, today I will not be voting for this. And if this were to, to get on our plate, the mayor will veto it. So that's another th consideration we have to think about as we move forward. So thanks again, uh, Council Member Chuck Dye. Thank you, Council Member Osmond, but I will not be voting for this today. Thank you, Council Member Rainville. Next in queue is Council Member Bita. Thank you, Madam President. I too will not be supporting this today. I think what's been happening um, around the rent uh, stabilization conversation is that black and brown people are believing that this 3% cap and a lot of these other things are somehow going to benefit them. And there is nowhere in this country where rent control or rent stabilization policies benefit people who look like me and the people who are, it's just become like this fear tactic to make people think somehow this will help them. This type of policy is going to help people who can afford rents. What we need here is an opportunity for pay more pay for people. We need some type of supplemental income for people. That is how they're going to benefit in housing. That is how we get people out of encampments. People need to make more money. We need to be there for them financially, not by these types of policies. Look at New York City. Look at San Francisco. If you've ever been there, most of the people that you see living in the streets look like me. They live homeless because of these types of policies. This is not gonna benefit the people of Minneapolis. I wanna have conversations with my colleagues about how we help black and brown people in this city into home ownership, into uh, being able to grow their families. This policy will only benefit you where you currently live. If you have more children, if you have family members that have to move into you, move in with you, once you move, you, you I mean, that rent control policy, it's, it's not for you anymore. You got to pay way more rents. Your landlords might not be taking care of the properties like you need to. And I feel like this is just going to push a lot of black and brown people who love the city of Minneapolis into first tier suburbs. We can no longer have that. We deserve to live in the city. We deserve to have access to city transportation and other things. And this is not it. I want to have real conversations and stop scaring people into believing that rent control is going to help them. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Council Member. Next in queue is Council Member Wansley for her second comment on this item. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I absolutely agree with some sentiments raised by uh, both Council Member Vita and even Council Member Payne. Um, I think we all collectively agree that rent control is just one piece of a larger solution or you know array of solutions that we need to move forward to address the fact that our city is being increasingly unaffordable uh, for working class people but as you highlighted for black and brown folks um, but also as you noted um, most folks who are facing house housing insecurity who are living in our encampments right now do look like us look like me and you and that's under our current housing market um, and I also know in New York there's folks who look like me and you uh, who can stay there right now as you know all the rents around there basically cost your firstborn child um, the only reason why they are able to stay there is because of the policies that working class people like those who are in our audience fought for like rent control that is giving them longevity in cities like that as well um, so I want to highlight the very things that you're laying out the worst case scenario it's happening under our current housing market. Black and brown people have been priced out of their neighborhoods in North Minneapolis, where we know in War 4, 70% of single family homes are owned under a monopoly of one of the largest uh, real estate investors that actually caused uh, the housing crash of 2008 and then stripped wealth from the black folks that you and I 
We, can't, we came here to serve. So here's a way to do a full circle of giving them the protections that the market does not care to provide them, that big landlords and property developers do not care to provide them. Because the things that you laid out is happening right now. Encampments are happening every day. Black and brown folks have to go out to the suburbs because that's the only place where they can live. That is happening right now. And if we don't do an array of solutions like rent control, fully funding a public housing levy, I would love to work with you too if you're talking about increasing minimum wage is not afraid of the you know sky falling down as target told us let's do $25 an hour like let's let's kick all the solutions forward then if we really want to talk about the ways in which economic um, basically uh, <laughs> economic divestments poured intentionally into black and brown folks has made it so that they can't even live in the cities that they build that they basically help function so I'm all on board for working on an array of solutions. This is one piece of it. Um, and let's you know, pour all this energy and discussion towards figuring out how we're gonna move the next around housing, around minimum wages, around making sure people get clean air. There's a whole comprehensive work, uh, a list of options or a list of policies that this body can take up and could have been taken up this past year, but folks didn't have the will to do so. We could do that now. So I'm, I'm here for it. So thank you for raising that. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Wansley. Um, and and I will note, we are not trying to legislate a policy here today. We are merely moving forward a motion. Um, so, I, Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> um, you know, in the last couple of years uh, since I've been on, on this council, uh, I've done a lot of work, uh, some of it right alongside the council president as well on anti-displacement policy, anti-gentrification policy. Uh, I've had a lot of discussions with a lot of council members and a lot of advocates around the country around, um, around policies like rent stabilization. Uh, I will say that through probably hundreds of hours of discussion, today might be the first time that I've heard someone claim that these policies do not help black and brown people. That's absurd. And, uh, and and it's the first it's the first time. No information, just said it. Um, and so uh, and so I, I wanted to say that. And it's 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 not appropriate. It's the only it's the only thing that you've heard on this dais that actually was a explicitly fear mongering. It's the only thing on this dais that you've heard today that's explicitly fear mongering. And so I just wanted to. I I, I was hoping we could just sort of take this vote. But when crazy things are said in this dais, I think it's it's it's, it's important that we go ahead and correct the record. All right, that's okay. Uh, the the other the other thing the other thing that I want to say is that uh, the people the people who have done the most to fight gentrification the people who have uh, 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 who have been doing this work and advocating for this work for years are not us on this dais, but it's the advocates and some of the people in this room. They know gentrification and anti gentrification policy better than any of us. They're advocating for a policy. And I think that we should not be disingenuous in saying we know what will and will not uh, uh, generate gentrification when the people who do the work, the people who know it the best, are advising us. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it's, I think, I think we, it's our, our role to listen. That doesn't mean that the final policy has to look like it's laid out here. We're going to have that debate. But I don't think that we should say we know what gentrification is when we're not the ones who, are, who have been the advocates and the knowledge bearers on that, the people in the audience, the advocates out in the street have been. So I felt like it was necessary to say that after some of the comments that were made today. Councilmember Chugtai. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I want to just come back to what this is all about. Um, I represent Ward 10, an 80% renter community with the second highest density of renters in the city. Uh, in the last couple of months, more than ever in my year and a half here. Um, my office is working on constituent casework where tenants are facing unbelievable hikes. We're talking about 30 and 40% rent hikes. I've never seen that um, in, in early 2021, even when we had just, or in early 2022, when we had just passed question three. Um, research tells us that rent regulations have been effective at achieving two goals. The first is maintaining below market rent levels, um, and the second is moderating price appreciation. Generally, places with stronger rent control programs have more success preventing large price appreciation than weaker programs do. This is why it's one 
tool in a toolbox of policies to intervene in the housing, affordability, and displacement crisis residents in the city are facing. It is one of the most powerful. We know that renters deserve the same stability in housing costs that homeowners have in the form of a mortgage. Investment in other policies has not kept pace with the severity of the crisis. That's one of the core problems we're facing. In total, this year, we've, we've invested $11 million in programs like Guaranteed Basic Income, Stable Homes, Stable Schools, and the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And I am really excited to work with all of you to find the money to significantly increase our investment in these existing programs as, as important interventions in addressing the crisis that we're facing. We absolutely should do more on top of the existing programs. We should advance a tenant opportunity to purchase, which is work that began in 2021 and is um, is is happening right now. Council Member Ellison and I author our, our ordinance on tenant opportunity to purchase. One of the reasons staff hasn't been able to devote as many resources to completing that policy is because we told them to go and staff the rent stabilization work group, right? Um, we should absolutely increase our investment in the affordable housing trust fund. We should um, advance a public housing levy and invest in full service community schools across our city and address food security and invest more in stable homes, st stable schools and guaranteed basic income and the 4D program and consider municipal banking. These things together are going to address um, and, and things beyond that that we don't know about yet together are going to address the the severe crisis that we're we're in and our residents are in um for me this is about reacting to what i'm seeing happening to my constituents in this moment and to um and to to advance a policy that is in front of us this year but absolutely agree that there is a lot more that we can do. And what I hear is a lot of agreement on this body in, in working on those things together, which is really exciting, especially as we head into budget season this year. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. I do want to just point out that because you mentioned mortgages being stable, but every year mortgages go up. And the reason why they go up is because of taxes. And taxes will pay for all the things you mentioned and will drive some people out of this city. Council Member Vitale. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to say, I think what's ridiculous is that council members who are gonna benefit from this kind of policy no, I mean, like, this is, this is going to benefit council members who make six figures, not people who live in Ward 4 that make $45,000 a year, period. That's ridiculous. Call the roll. That's just not fair. Council Member Johnson. No. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Nay. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. No. President Jenkins. Aye. There are seven ayes and five nays. That motion carries and um <clears throat> Staff will begin to work on that ordinance. Um, Madam President, before we depart from this item, um, if you would indulge me, I think it would be helpful to talk about next steps since we're talking about a very tight timeline for a ballot question. With the approval of this item, of course, it goes to the mayor. This is an act of council. The mayor can approve or not approve this action. Um, we have time within the schedule that we've lined out for the council to reconsider if the mayor does veto this action. However, I think, and I won't speak for them, they're at the dais, the attorneys now know that the body wishes uh, you know, this, this work to proceed. 
and they will begin the process of drafting the ordinance aligned with this process. In the next council cycle, we will begin the legislative process in this item. That starts with notice, as Council Member Shugtai indicated in her first comments. Following notice would be the formal introduction and referral to the Biz Inspections, Housing, and Zoning Committee where it will remain as the body has the opportunity to perfect. So in terms of next steps after the formal introduction referral, um, at that time, amendments could come forward. So when this is on the agenda in two cycles, at the introduction, first reading and, and referral process, it's up for another vote. That's the next formal vote by this body on the process, and amendments would be in order at that time. Once it's referred to the biz committee, amendments could be brought forward at that time as well. The biz committee would be the body that will conduct the public hearing required on the ordinance. The public will have an opportunity to weigh in at that public hearing and give their pers uh, viewpoints on that policy proposal. Council will have a chance to refine again at committee in response to public input. So the uh, amendments could come forward after that public hearing is closed. Then it gets referred to full council for council's final um, action. I will remind everyone that because this is both a policy and a ballot question, which we don't do often, there are two very separate actions that are companion items. The policy on rent stabilization would be an ordinance, as we have said several times here. If approved ultimately by voters, that gets codified. Unlike ballot questions we've referred in the past, however, this is not an amendment to the city charter. This is actually the people of the city, if the voters, if they approve it, amending our code of ordinances, what are in effect our municipal statutes, something we've not done as a city prior. So if that passes, we would be amending the code. That would be the ordinance. But a ballot question by state law must be referred to voters in the form of a resolution. So a companion item will go forward with the ordinance and the attorneys will need to work with council to determine the language that actually gets um, referred to voters, the language that will show up on the ballot that's separate from the ordinance. Both of those, the ordinance and the resolution, must pass, can only pass with at least a majority vote of the body, meaning there must be at least seven affirmative votes for the ordinance and seven affirmative votes for the resolution, both. Both of those separate items are also subject to the mayor's approval or veto. And so in working with council members Shugtai and Osman, as I said briefly at the beginning, um, we are anticipating that we would finish with enough time that if a mayoral veto were to come forward on both or either of those separate issues, the council would have a chance to reconsider those as is required under the city charter. Um, and so that is a high level summary of next steps, opportunity for further refinement and perfection through both amendment by this body, input from the public at the public hearing, which will be conducted by the committee of reference. Um, but I think the first piece to start with is now that there is consensus from the body around the components of that policy, the attorneys can begin the process of drafting that and that will expedite the work of having that ready when it's referred to biz for the public hearing. So just want to outline that. Uh, the procedures and appreciate that time. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I do want to just um, remind my colleagues, we all have the rules of decorum posted up in front of us. I would ask that we all please respect those uh, rules. I, as the chair, can only remind you it is your responsibility as elected members of this body to uh, adhere to those rules. Thank you. We will now proceed uh, to consider the added items under new business. I'll call on Councilmember Ellison to introduce the proposed legislative directive authored by Council Members Ellison, Koski, Wansley, related to a request from the mayor for information and data related to personnel actions. Council Member Ellison. Thank you, Madam President. This. Uh, <clears throat> This item, uh, as I said at the beginning of the meeting, is very similar to legislative directive that uh, I brought forward uh, a cycle ago, directed towards the clerks in the audit uh, department. Uh, I think this, uh, we, as we sort of started digging into the work, we realized that some of this work was going to need to be provided by other departments uh, with, on the executive side. And so uh, it always feels great when, some of your, when your colleague comes to and says, uh, hey, Great legislative directive, but I've got a way that we can improve it, and that's exactly what uh, Councilmember Koski did. Uh, she she uh, uh, had some ideas on how we could strengthen uh, the previous uh, directive, uh, and so that is, uh, that's reflected in what you see in front of you here. And so I can stand for questions, but also happy to have uh, Councilmember Koski and Councilmember uh, Wansley uh, speak on the item as well. Councilmember Koski. 
Uh, thank you, Madam President. I'd like to take a moment to explain how we got here, or at least how I got here today. Uh, when the Policy and Government Oversight Committee received a presentation on the personnel-related request regarding the appointed position in the Office of Community Safety, the Director of Partnership and Outreach, it was mentioned that the funding for this position came from a vacant crime prevention specialist, FTE, that was moved to OCS in the city's 2023 budget. When I heard this, it made me pause because I had no recollection of moving a vacant crime prevention specialist, FTE, to OCS in the city's 2023 budget. So I took a look at the city's 2023 budget book to check and there was no change item listed under OCS that showed that we moved a vacant crime prevention specialist to OCS. So then I met with Finance and Property Services to check and it turns out that yes, a vacant crime prevention specialist, FTE, that was moved to OCS in the city's 2023 budget without a change item and without it being mentioned in the department presentation. So it, to put it plainly, a vacant crime prevention specialist FTE was moved to OCS in the city's 2023 budget and this body approved it. But we had absolutely no way of knowing that's what we did. I was under the impression that all but one of the crime prevention specialists were moved from the neighborhood and community relations department to the Minneapolis Police Department. However, what actually happened was that some of the crime prevention specialists were moved to the Minneapolis Police Department and then some were moved elsewhere. Now I'll remind my colleagues, we have policies in place that are supposed to prevent this. We have policies in place that require that this body approve the moving of any FTEs between departments. But this was put into the city's 2023 budget without this body knowing, and so we approve this without knowing. This happened in multiple cases. Today I just spoke about one of these instances, but it has happened across several departments. FTEs were moved in the city's Minneapolis 2023 budget with little to no transparency being provided to the city council. And frankly, what's done is done, but before we move forward, this body must be provided with all of the information we deem necessary to make the decisions we're asked to make. And I wanna be clear, this legislative directive is not about any specific personnel related request. It is not about any specific position or any specific person. It is about creating transparency where transparency is sorely lacking. This is about us creating transparency in our decision making. Our city staff has already been working diligently to provide the information requested in the previous legislative directive. And I thank our city staff for their work thus far. However, as new information has come to light throughout these conversations, it's become clear that we need additional information in order for us to be able to make informed decisions moving forward. And that is why this legislative directive, and that is what this legislative directive attempts to provide. If our city staff don't have the capacity to provide the information requested in the outline timeline, I do invite city staff, who I do not see here today right now, but to come forward uh, with what a reasonable timeline might be. But I'll note that my position remains the same. I don't believe that we as a body should take further action regarding personnel related requests until we have provided, we've been provided with this information. And beyond this legislative directive, as chair of the budget committee, it is my responsibility to ensure that moving forward, this doesn't happen and we are provided all of the information necessary to make informed financial decisions. Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just wanna also say thank you to co-authors, uh, Councilmember Koski and Ellison, as well as Clerk uh, Carl for your work on this. Um, many of you are aware that I've been raising questions about uh, FTEs uh, and how they're being created um, and modified as part of our overall government restructure process for many months now. And some of those questions and, and, and conversations, I do believe laid the foundation for this legislative directive. Um, it's very clear in order for this council to, to do our duties on oversight and budgeting, we need up-to-date in-depth information on staffing. And that's what this uh, legislative directive gets us. Um, that's been something that, again, throughout our entire government you know, restructure process, um, we have not gotten that information because we kind of rushed through it um, in a haphazard way. Um, and we didn't resolve key questions about how we were organizing um, not only our city government, but how and the ways in which these positions would be factored into it. Um, so I just want to make sure, you know, that we are in light, that this is the byproduct of many, many conversations, many, many questions that have not been um, tended to over the past year. Um, and this legislative directive aims to somewhat correct 
pieces of that by ensuring that the council and the public has a high level overview of all staffing changes and how they fit together. And I look forward to using this as a tool to help, you know, council use our full autonomy and authority over the budget um, as we're thinking of how do we use uh, taxpayer dollars and programs that we get to create or support um, in meeting the needs of our residents. So again, just thank you to my colleagues and staff for helping bring um, what has been uh, a year worth of conversation and um, discussion uh, finally into something tangible. Councilmember Chavez. Uh, Council President Jenkins, I just want to thank Councilmember Koski, Wansley, and Elson, and the clerk for working on this. In my ward, in Ward 8 and Ward 12, we actually had an empty sitting crime prevention specialist for years. And because of the shifting of this, I had to work with the chief to figure out how we're going to find funding to make sure that this position was temporarily filled because of the way this shifted. So it was very difficult. It took more than 10 different meetings with different staff, the chief, and because of the work we were able to do with the chief and his commitment to getting this position filled, we were able to fill that out. And we're gonna be having a crime prevention specialist soon in the part of Ward 8, 9, and 12 that has been without one for years. So just happy for the work we were able to do to get that done, but also thank uh, the work that Councilor Koski, Wansley, and Ellison are doing to make sure that stuff like this doesn't happen again. Councilmember Johnson. Want to switch? Yeah. Could turn it on? There we go. All right, my microphone button isn't working. We'll, we'll check that out after the meeting. But uh, thank you, Madam President. And, and I want to thank the authors for bringing this forward. And I really appreciate, really, really, really appreciate their work on this and bringing this to light. And I don't know if there are any plans from the administration to provide an explanation to the council around this, but I think that that is due to the council and that we should have an understanding of why, if processes weren't followed, why that was the case. And so we can understand that moving forward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. Seeing no further um, comments or questions, I will ask the clerk to call the roll on the um, motion, I'm sorry, the legislative directive by Ellison, Koski, and Wansley. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Osman. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. There are 12 ayes. That carries and that motion is adopted. Madam President, again, just so we're clear with the body and the clerk's office will certainly um, follow up and provide notice, but Part of this action was rescinding prior directives that had been issued related to personnel actions and also directing that any and all personnel actions here forward go to the budget committee, centralizing all of those requests um, to the body, to its budget committee, which is all 13 council members. So I just wanted to highlight this should then eliminate um, personnel matters going from one committee to the next and should centralize all of those functions into the budget committee where the body sitting all 13 members as a committee can take those up. Um, and so we also are eliminating, uh, I think, one or two prior directives and consolidating that into this directive. So um, when we get our update from the administration on the status of legislative directives, that means we'll have just one direction related to personnel actions. Thank you, Clerk Carl. Um, Colleagues, we have completed all business on our agenda and I will take up any announcements. Do any of my colleagues have any announcements today? Councilmember Rainville. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I did want to, uh, I went to two uh, events with uh, some of our employees. The first was this morning uh, at 6 a.m. over at the New Public Works garage on University and 27th. And, I was looking for my fellow Northeast council member there, council member Payne, uh, uh, and I look forward to bringing you over there maybe another day at 6 a.m. But <laughs> I, 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 oh, and uh, I would be remiss uh, that I, I was joined by council member Koski. So thank you, Emily, for 
coming up from the south side to spread some cheer. But uh, in a very serious note, uh, that was the crew that Emily and I talked to was uh, the, ru the rubbish haulers, the solid, uh, uh, solid waste, yard waste, uh, organics, and we had the chance to thank them for their service. Uh, to, to view the, the facility, it's the newest facility from Public Works, which uh, really aids in their uh, retention. And so that, that was a very uh, a good morning uh, for me and for Council Member Koski to thank those employees. And last night, I attended a police graduation. We have 15 more members, young women, young men, brave young women, young men, to serve us. And, and in the spirit of one of our speakers earlier today that uh, Council Member Wansley had brought in, uh, who encourages us to all work together to bring peace and to not have another uh, terrible uh, brutality incident in our city, whether it's George Floyd or anyone else. And, and in that spirit of working together, I, I would like our fellow, uh, my fellow council members to acknowledge uh, the importance of, of the police department and the fact that they put their lives on the line every day as well. Last Friday, I went to the ceremony honoring all the police officers who have been killed in the line of duty and that was very touching. People, our officers endanger themselves every day as part, as part of our public safety solution. So I just wanna acknowledge the brave women and men uh, in our, our police department. So uh, thank you for uh, letting me have the floor here and all of us realize that violence affects all of us and all of our professions every day. And it's our job, it's our number one job is to have public safety for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rainville. I too attended that graduation last night and congratulated the 15 new uh, police officers and reminded them that they must become a part of the community and not stand apart from the community. The chair will recognize Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I just want to emphasize that, you know, today is the anniversary of George Floyd's murder by uh, the Minneapolis Police Department. Um, and in light of that, community members, some of whom uh, spoke today and received the resolution, they're going to be gathering at George Floyd Square, Square at 8 p.m. to hold a candlelight vigil. Um, and I encourage my colleagues and the public to join as we honor the life um, of George Floyd, the community um, that has continued to um, uphold his life in the value that it um, had in our community before Derek Chauvin uh, decided to exercise uh, authority in taking his life. Um, and also standing with, as we did this morning, many of the families who um, did not have a Darnella Frazier in their life that recorded their murders and have yet to receive any type of formal justice. Um, so. That's gonna be happening tonight at George Floyd Square from 8 to 10 p.m. There's also gonna be a Rise and Remember a Festival at the Square on Saturday. Um, there's just numerous opportunities over the next several days uh, to be in community where our residents, as they not only grieve, but celebrate the life of George Floyd and um, dig down in our commitment to uh, centering them um, and also digging down in the commitment to not continuing to, to allow the pattern of Derek Chauvin's to exist in our pol police force. Um, so I wanna hold them um, particularly in light on this day um, and hope to see some of you all there. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Wansley. Uh, you will certainly see me there as those events are happening in Ward 8. And so I was going to actually um, announce those events myself, so thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I will just uh, note that um, June is Pride Month and there are many events that will be happening um, celebrating Pride, including the Pride Festival, which will be held Sunday, June 25th um, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and I am working on trying to, along with Council Member Goodman and others, to ensure that the City Council can have a, a dedicated spot in that parade. And so uh, please um, stay tuned for that. Are there any other announcements? Seeing none, um, we have completed all of our business today and with nothing further to come before this council and without objection, this meeting is adjourned.